I was always thinking, let's do content that's African, because I go back all the time and I see a lot of content being produced and people being broke. And that just didn't resonate well to me. That's the founder and CEO of Star News Mobile, Guy Kamgang. Guy is a guy. Actually, my full name is Guy Kamgang Kwam. Kwam being my Cameroonian name. I'm from Cameroon. And Star News Mobile is a startup selling and producing short-form video content that's distributed via telcos. The company launched first in Cote d'Ivoire, then Congo and Cameroon, before moving into its first English-speaking country, South Africa, late in 2020. So I said, well, what if I could take this great local content in Africa? You know, this this creativity is just unbelievable. What if I could take this content, the video content, and distribute it through African, so African and local content for local people, and but do it with a telco so I can also put in a monetization model. In this series of episodes, we've been exploring the entrepreneurs and startups digitizing analog and fragmented industries. And in this episode, we want to expand our scope of exploration to include entertainment for mass market consumers on the continent. In a world of abundant free content on YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, and other platforms, Star News is building a viable business selling a la carte paid for micro content bundled with telco data, and they're selling it to millions of African consumers, while simultaneously helping creators make money off of their content as well. Whereas for so many of our past interviewees, their competition is with cash or with pen and paper, for Star News, their competition is perhaps with newspapers or radio, or even with the lack of professional creators who are able to make a living off of their own content. So in this episode, Guy and I talk about Star News' content development and distribution model, his experience selling value-added services through telcos, how to manage a B2B relationship with telcos, their strategy to launch first in Francophone African countries, and more. Before we start, we'd like to thank MFS Africa for their sponsorship of the entirety of this conversational series. MFS Africa has the largest mobile money footprint on the continent. Their API hub connects over 200 million mobile wallets across nearly 30 African countries. This got us thinking about partnering with telcos, something that Guy and I talked a lot about in this episode, and that we know is something that can be a cause of frustration for smaller startups. And it's something I've also talked to Adia Soho about. She sat on both sides of the table, first as the director of digital business with the Nigerian telco Eti Salat, and later as the VP of growth for the credit as a service platform, Migo. Let's start with insights for those on the startup side of the table. There isn't a strong understanding of what leverage means on the startup side. I used to get a lot of startups show up and just say, well, I've got a great product. If, if only you would just send a text message to your $23 million, I'll be the next Zuckerberg. But then they would not be open to any feedback or sort of any suggestions that said your product isn't what people will like and then we just launch you know and nothing would happen and everybody would get frustrated and say well the telco does this and the telco does that the telco charges too much for revenue share and so on and so forth so when you have a product with no users and you show up and make demands on what you you feel like you're supposed to earn that that's not a way to negotiate so i would tell people look sign the contract it's only two years Right. And then at the end of two years, all you need to do is put me in a position where I have to adjust my commercials to respond to you. If you have traction, if you have a user base that's important to me that is generating recurring revenue, I will adjust. And I, I gave examples frequently of people that had you know, backed me into a corner. So I would invite startups to back me into said corner. But that didn't necessarily it didn't necessarily happen. Later in the show, we'll hear more from Adia on what the telcos need to do better in these partnerships. Now, here's our conversation with Guy Kamgang, the founder and CEO of Star News. You're listening to The Flip, the podcast exploring more contextually relevant stories from entrepreneurs around Africa. Can we transition into how did the business get started? What were the sort of things that you were seeing, especially given your experience working with telcos in particular, that led to you starting this business? It was a combination of a lot of things. For the past 10 years, I've been in what is a tradition called value-added services, a vast business with the telco. So providing content and all kinds of related services to mobile subscribers through the telcos. So build relationships with Orange, MTN, Vodacom, Merrill Telecom throughout their continent. And I was basically just doing content delivery services and I, would, I did really, I mean, quite well. I was doing a lot of text-to-win campaigns, mega promos, 
anything that has to do with SMS, you know, jokes, horoscopes, I was behind a lot of the a lot of the services. But after a while, I realized that I was in a lot of times. I'm just grabbing content pieces, you know, basically information from the internet and uh, delivering it to Africa. And you know, it was like, all right, cool, but you could do better than this. And about 12, 2012, 13, 14, Snapchat started to come on the scene. And I'm here in LA. I happen to know some people at Snapchat. And I realized video is definitely the way to go. So I kind of said, well, if I could anticipate this wave and get video into Africa, that will probably be interesting. And at the same time, the carriers, which I had a great relationship with, they tell me, hey, we're going to deploy 4G. We're going to need, you know, rich media, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, all right, forget tech. Let's go for video. The problem is there was, and I was always thinking, let's do content that's African. Because I go back to Africa all the time, and I see a lot of content being produced and people being broke. And I, that just didn't resonate well to me. So I said, well, what if I could take this great local content in Africa, you know, the creativity is, is just unbelievable. So I said, what if I could take this content, the video content, and distribute it through African, so African and local content for local people, and but do it with a telco so I can also put in a monetization model because I knew how to monetize content. I've been doing this for many, many years. So I knew what the price point was in terms of what people would be willing to pay for content. And I figured if I can create a platform for video content delivery, then I can ride a 10, 15 year window before anybody really realizes what's what's happening. Let's get even deeper into the weeds in terms of, I guess, both content development and distribution. So how does all of it work? Let's start maybe on the content side. I know you're working with a lot of big influencers in a number of different African markets, but can you kind of break down a little bit more of how the content development part works first, and then we can talk about distribution afterwards? So, yeah, that's that's actually a good question because that's the toughest part. It's a least organized part, content in Africa. The production quality is not really always great. The flow is not always there, but... Again, I was thinking the Snapchat, Instagram model, right? I knew people were producing content. I knew they were doing it for other platforms, but these other platforms weren't able to monetize. So I said, okay, there is content out there. We just have to figure out a way to get it, bring the level of quality up and distribute it. So I went to the influencers because those are the guys who are already producing content. And I said, look, guys, you're already producing content for all these platforms. Give me some of the content that you're producing anyway. So it started off as just short form, and short form was the way to go because, as you could see, it's, if you do long form content in Africa, data is too expensive, so it's really difficult to make money or even to sell it. So I said, okay, from a content side, I know I can get short form content from local influencers, and I can also invest into production of content with non sophisticated influencers who just want to be out there on digital platforms. So it started out with influencers. It basically went from just your basic celebrity content on a, on a flash drive, for example, or through WhatsApp that we would then distribute. Then started working with more traditional content production houses. And now we're investing into content. We're developing content. We're creating our own. So you gather all this content. Then on the distribution side, I know you have deep carrier relationships and you bundle the services with data, for example. So can you just explain the sort of mechanics behind how that works? And if I'm a consumer, what my options are? Yeah, so distribution was kind of the easier part, even though for most people, that'll be the toughest part because of my existing relationship. So I could, instead of delivering, distributing text-based content, I was just distributing video-based content. So I knew the price points. I knew how to bundle it. Like I said, I know how marketing works with the telco. I know when and what they're selling. So I was able to create packages within their data their data bundles or even send it on packages for the consumer at a price point of anywhere from three to five to 10 cents a day where it, the money is taken off their airtime. So that was something I was very familiar with on the monetization side and on this distribution side as well. You know, using data 
as including the package or on the distribution side, not going through it an app. I knew how difficult it is to download apps in Africa. So we went away from the app model and we created a web app instead. So I buy a bundle, video bundle, that gets taken, if we're talking about South Africa, for example, per video, two, two rand per day to access the channel. And then will I get, you know, an SMS with a link that I can click and it's a web app and I can watch out of this bundle that I purchased already, I can watch these videos. That's right, yeah. And I think the distribution model for me, it's interesting because it raises a few questions. The first one is, is this sort of natural global question of, I'll, I'll say like a Western question, which is like, why would somebody pay for video when there is Snapchat, there is Instagram out there, and a lot of the creators are or were still are creating content for those platforms as well. So I know you have an answer for why that doesn't work for a mass market African consumer, but can you at least explain a little bit more from a consumer perspective of why this model that you've implemented works better than these data-heavy apps? The easiest answer would be to say, well, with your two RAND, data is included. And if you go on Instagram, for example, it's a data guzzler. So with two RAND, you get pretty much nothing. I mean, look, these platforms here were really created for unlimited data. It's very difficult to consume Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, all these guys on a limited data plan. If you're going to be frustrated, you're going to run out of data every five minutes. So because we have data included, it's an interesting selling point. The second more interesting aspect is that there's two more. So from a content producer standpoint, they have an option. They can go on Snapchat, they can go on, on Instagram, but they're not making any money on these other platforms. So this is a platform where with the two rent, we split with them. So obviously, some content they will reserve for us because they know, okay, I can give this content to people for free, but I can also make money, so why not do it? So there's also the drive from the actual content producers who are saying, look, I can make money. And now they're making money. It's not an idea anymore. Every month we're paying out a significant amount of money compared to nothing. So that's really kind of the, the second driver. And the third driver, from a consumer standpoint, the real experience of Star News is not just about the content that you get, but it's, it's about getting, for example, concert I was talking about. We're giving away tickets to concerts. So now you're part of an experience where you're not just seeing a video, but you also get a chance to win things. The chance to win is a very big draw in Africa, and we're actually rewarding people for being on Star News. So there's all these three elements that help us. So from a business model perspective, and that's the other sort of thing in terms of a misconception, I would have said, I don't know. I mean, it's a, a two ran bundle. Like obviously you have from a distribution perspective, there's low marginal costs, but then you have fixed costs in terms of the revenue share, both with the telco and with the content creator. So if it's two rand, you're taking, let's say a third of that. I would have felt like, taking a third of a very small data bundle is a challenging proposition, but is it that scale works it out or how does that work? Okay, let's just say we have a million users who give us two, two rand a day, right? So what is that? That's two million rand a day. That's 60 million rand a month, right? So 60 million rand is $4 million a month on 1 million users. So even if I'm only keeping 10% of that, and everything else goes to the carrier and the content producer. Let's say I'm just a platform, which is not the case, but I'm just a platform, right? That's $400,000. That's 1 million users. There's a potential for 600 million. So that's what we, we're looking at. And I haven't even introduced you all the different models we have on top of the two rand a day. So we, we have 10 rand a week, but within the two rand a day, I mean, we haven't introduced all these, these features, but we also have games as in, where then you can win prices. So you pay the two rand, but you can also get a chance if you pay an extra rand or an extra five rand a week, you can win a concert ticket or we can win some airtime. And down the line, we're going to be doing more partnership with brands to sell or offer more things. And we're going to start selling music. We're going to start selling more stuff. So just thinking at the ecosystem level, if Instagram and Snapchat are data guzzlers and are not the apps for your average or the mass market African consumer, 
then for Star News, who is your competitor? What is your competition for like your consumer's time? Is it radio? Is it newspaper? Is it what are you competing with in, in your opinion? You know, that's a good question. I guess we're in a different we're in a different space where it's very difficult because we're a mix of YouTube and short form Netflix and then to some level a Patreon or OnlyFans. So I, I think we almost feel like we've created our own niche you would argue why not youtube why would they go on youtube but some of the content they get on star news is not going to be on youtube okay all right so why wouldn't they go to instagram well because instagram is takes too much data or why wouldn't they go on netflix well same problem you know it's so expensive so you know we've basically put ourselves in a corner where with this competition it's not clear cut that yeah i'd love for you to sort of talk a little bit about if we can take a, a little bit of step back of the countries you're in, the sort of growth that you've seen in the five years as a business, how all of it has gone to, to sort of be now a revenue generating business at scale. So, I mean, we started, the idea was 2016, but we first went live end of 2017, early 2018. I would say really it's been two years, two and a half years. And just when we started, we started in Cote d'Ivoire, I recall, so with one carrier. And then MTN came on board, so now we had two. Then we jumped into Congo, we had three. Then we jumped into Cameroon, we had four. And then the second carrier, MTN in Cameroon, now we had five. And last summer, we went into South Africa, now we have six. So it's, it's just been one country after the next, going into the country, getting the local content um, partnerships in place, getting the local integration, blah, blah, blah. And so it's, it's a lot of work. You know, we have our people on the ground in all these markets. Was there any reason or any insights or any opportunities that compelled you to start in Francophone or French speaking Africa? I'm just curious to know if there was any reason other than maybe the fact that you're Cameroonian that compelled you to start there. Well, I mean, that's, that's a big reason. I was already there. So it was just an extension of business I was already doing. And to be perfectly honest, I knew I could dominate Francophone Africa. I wanted to build a business that, you know, I didn't know if I was ever going to raise money because, you know, you never know these things. So it was important for me to be dominant in one place and understand how the business runs because I knew MTN is everywhere. So if I can do a good job, I can easily transition to any, any MTN market. In fact, that's how we got the group deal. We're doing so well in Cote d'Ivoire, the group found out about it. But it was, I knew I could dominate Francophone. And from Francophone, I could expand into Anglophone, which is a bit more challenging. I mean, it's bigger. Like Nigeria alone, it's a game changer. So it was yeah. important yeah. To, to be dominant in one region. And so even if I wasn't able to expand into Anglophone, just having Francophone would be enough for me. And just as it relates to sort of expansion, I'm curious to get a little bit deeper into the relationship with the telcos. I mean, you mentioned starting a relationship with MTN in one country and then group took interest. And I presume they're sort of taking you into different markets at their discretion now as well. So do you have any insights as it relates to your dealings with telcos? Or is there, is there any other lessons that you've learned in, in working with telcos in this regard? I mean, you know, telcos, a lot of people get intimidated by them, you know, MTN, Orange, oh my God. I mean, I mean they're big organizations, massive organizations, but if you understand their processes, how they work, and you know the people, they're fairly easy to work with, but you just have to have done it for 15 years. And very few people have done it for 15 years. So the deal that we strike are really about, it's a revenue share. I know what to expect from them. There's no illusion. And I know what I have to bring to be successful with them. So sometimes they will ask me for exclusivity. I might give it, give it to them for a couple of months on a particular channel, a particular piece of content. And it's actually a remarkably interesting to be part of this discussion of how to pr improve the mobile experience of their subscribers, because that's really what they care about. At the end of the day, obviously, they're making tons of money. But it's about, is this really good for my subscribers? Does this make sense? And sometimes they'll come back and they challenge me. They say, hey, we don't like this channel, or can you bring us this? So it's very collaborative. And they obviously like it then. Also, I mean, apart from the 
customer user experience, it moves the needle for them from a revenue perspective, I'd have to imagine, or otherwise it wouldn't be worth their time to even try to do this and to put their resources behind it. Yeah, no, I mean, if, if your service is whack, they're not, they're not going to give you the time of day. You need to have done your homework, not just on your, you know, what you bring, but how to make it work. Because a lot of Europeans or whatever will come and say, hey, I have this great service, push it, and it's a super huge data guzzler. And they'll be like, come back in two years. So you're going to go, oh, I hate working with MTN. What are you talking about? Like, I'm not going to try to push something that I know the handset cannot support. You're not going to play a high definition type of service. That's not going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, switching gears just a little bit to talk about content and media businesses. I think it's really interesting what's happening in a global sense. And I'm just going to share this to sort of set up the question, but it doesn't necessarily apply to Africa as much. But, you know, Netflix was killing it in distribution. And then they had a lot of high costs from a licensing perspective on content. And so they went to do originals. And then Disney said, we're going to pull everything off Netflix and we're going to build our own distribution because we have all this IP. And so the opportunity, the challenge of owning distribution versus also owning the IP and the sort of second order effects that that's unlocked for Disney, which is maybe a separate conversation altogether. But I thought it was interesting how you mentioned distribution through the telcos is huge, but then you guys are doing some sort of original content and investing in content development as well. So I'm curious if the sort of global conversation about content strategy has any impact or is it just an obvious thing for you that like you need more content and you're going to have to put more resources to it? Or is there other strategies or other insights that guide your, your decision or the strategies that you're pursuing from a content development perspective in particular? Well, you're right to talk about Netflix and Disney Plus. The reason why we decided to invest into content is simply because nobody is fucking doing it. <laughs> it's that simple. There's so much content that can be created out of Africa. People are so creative. You give somebody a Nokia and you shoot a movie with that. People would do anything to talk about themselves, to talk about their culture, to talk about their history, to talk about their family. It's, it's just unbelievable. So we were being pitched all these, these little different things that, and we realized it doesn't even cost a lot of money because we're a short form platform. It's not like we have to produce, you know, Hollywood type production with those budgets. And also, if we want to give local content to African, like if you look around, everybody's providing European content, even the telenovelas. If you go to Francophone Africa, you have so much content that's coming from overseas. But yet, you know, there's local content creators who are just dying to be, to be able to live off their content. So it was kind of like, if we're able to distribute and monetize, why not take a chance? on the production as well, because I know how to make money from the content I distribute, so I can support the, the content producer. That's the only reason why we're doing it. If I had content readily available, I wouldn't be in the content business, I'd just be in the distribution business. But unfortunately, got to do what you got to do. Sounds like there's an opportunity for people to create production agents, like short firm production agencies, and, and sort of do the content development aggregation on your behalf and then just sell to you guys. <laughs> I would love that. If somebody could step up and tell me I can do it, I'll be like, okay, let's go. Well, so let's let's talk about the content, actually. I mean, what's the sort of sweet spot in terms of, you know, you mentioned it can't be HD length of time. I mean, what is, from a specific content production perspective, what works on Star News? We have so much data. So the interviews work well, the celebrity interviews. So what we'll do is we'll spend, say, a day with a celebrity or half a day. And we'll just conversation, conversation, and we cut them in five-minute segments. So a two-hour interview becomes 10 days' worth of content. Recently, we've had some success with the comedy channel, local comedians. That's picking up a lot of a lot of traction. Cooking has been a big surprise. So we're doing that with a company in Cote d'Ivoire. Of course, soccer, football. It really varies. Even all, one operator to another, it could be different. Yeah. So I'd like to ask some purposely broad questions towards the end. I'm curious to know in the context of all of this, you know, media and telco stuff that we're talking about, are there things you're trying to understand better and learn more about as it relates to global trends or whatever else? What I would like to see happen is I would like the world to understand Africa better. What I'm eager to see is how basically the media, the whole media 
content space reacts to the day when now if they want content from Africa, it's there somewhere. And we're able to create a model where the content producers are making money from it. And when you're in America, images of Africa have always been the same for the past 100 years. But that's also because there was nothing else to really show or it wasn't the type of quality that you would expect from a local production warehouse. It's always going to be some European going to Africa and bringing back his view of Africa through his own lens. And I like to change the narrative, and that's really what I want to see happen. You know, be able to say, okay, well, now we're, we're really able to help people live off of their creativity and their talent because they're able to make money from it. So it, it could really be cool. Thanks again to MFS Africa for their sponsorship of this episode. Earlier in the show, we heard from Adia Soho, who shared some insights from her experience negotiating with startups while working at a telco. Now, let's go to the other side of the table from her experience on the startup side. On the other side with the telcos, it's just flexibility, latitude, creating opportunities as opposed to beating fists on a table and saying, I am the telco and you will do all that I say all the time. So I think just being able to accommodate innovation is a challenge in in companies that are very old. It's a challenge that is present in companies that have a business model that has seen some success and companies that have a certain way to make money. Telcos sell things like voice, data, SMS. These are, you know, it's like one product that touches everybody in the base. So I think just some accommodation of working with siloed specialists that startups are as opposed to mass market products, which is what the telco typically releases itself. Although even that's changing because with price plans and so on and so forth, there's lots of micro product proliferation there. I I definitely think there was, there were just gaps and a major, you know, mismatch from both sides. So yeah, both sides have a lot to deal with uh, and reconcile in order to have successful conversations. That's it for this week's episode of The Flip. Next week, we talk to the CEO of a startup digitizing education for millions of learners across the continent. See you then.